Good evening. How is everyone today? Um, the service that we're going to have tonight is going to be a tenebrae service. And uh, when we get to that point in the service, we have some pens and some pieces of paper over here, uh, nails and hammers over here. And we're going to take whatever you would like to surrender to Christ um, today. We're going to nail them to the cross. And then after the service is over, we'll take those and dispose of them. Nobody else will see them. So it's a totally private message. And then they will be incinerated when it's all done and flushed away forever. So we are surrendering whatever you want to surrender to Christ tonight as part of our service. Let's go to God in prayer, shall we? Almighty Father, as we hear your word tonight, look with mercy on us, your family, for which our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners, to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As we are in the midst of Holy Week, our most important week of the Christian calendar, let's remember what has led us up to today. During Holy Week, we observe the end of the Lenten season that started back in March. And this year, as we've gone through this, it's been a time of reflection of all that God has done for us by going to the cross to bear our sins and the sins of the world. In addition to that, we have posted on our social media and sent out an email and, and prayed over this on Sunday, but it's very specific prayer that we've been praying together over the course of this Lenten season. Our Holy Week started with that Holy Wednesday, and Holy Wednesday commemorates the bargain of Judas by a clandestine spy among the disciples. Last night would have been known as Monday Thursday. It's a not much known uh, night or day of the Holy Week. It is a Christian holy day that commemorates events such as the washing of the feet and the Last Supper. Monday in the Christian dictionary translates into the washing of feet. As we come into our communion time tonight, I want you to uh, think about the events of the Lenten season, the things that we've discussed during our services in the Lenten season here and really truly what this means, this, this day, Good Friday, means. And it talks about the better time to come. So we're, it's a precursor to coming towards Sunday after having such a dark day today. So as we come into this time of communion, um, let us reflect on those. Tomorrow is Holy Saturday, and it's a Christian re religious observance that ends the Lenten season. So tomorrow officially ends that Lenten season, falling on the day before Easter Sunday. The observance commemorates the final day of Christ's death, which is traditionally associated with his triumph descent into hell. This can be a traditional way that God's people atone for sin in the Old Testament was through the blood sacrifices of animals performed in the temple. In order to provide atonement and to be washed clean of our sins, a perfect sacrifice had to be made. And it was coming then for all mankind, which is where we are today. God's only son, Jesus. Jesus took the sins of the world and made an atonement for them once and for all. So you and I are set free from those sins. Our penance is paid by Christ Jesus on the cross this very day. By our baptism, we are symbolically made clean, but that really is an affirmation of what Jesus has already done for us on the cross. It is our way to show our acknowledgement and the acceptance of that sacrifice that he made for that, 
for us. Christ Jesus gave his life for us so that we might live. And by joining in in communion together, joining together communion, that means that we are honoring that sacrifice when we bring what the cross and leave at the cross with our sins, our prayers and petitions that we bring to Jesus. I'll give you a passage now from Luke before we go into our communion. Luke 23, 44 through 49 says, It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. And when all the people who had gathered to witness his sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. When we talk about that sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we think about the day that led up to that and, and what it took for him to get up to that point. And he was severely beaten. He was lashed 39 times. His back was laid open bare to the bone, bleeding out profusely. And then they made him carry a cross, which weighed approximately 290 pounds from the downtown in the city in the square all the way up to the top of the hill in Golgotha until he could walk no more. And then he was allowed to have someone carry the cross on up. When we think about that, we think about that when we break our bread. He was talking to his disciples on the night that he was betrayed and he said, take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. And that's what he was talking about. He was taking on all the punishment for the sins of all mankind. Those that had happened and those that were yet to come, his body was broken for you and I. Likewise, in the meal, he took the cup and he said, This is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. His blood literally was poured out of his body, washing our sins away. And so when he was nailed to that cross, it wasn't just an ordinary event. It wasn't a murderer. It wasn't a, a, you know, a person who had been tried and found guilty of a grievous crime. It was an innocent man nailed to the cross. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, uh, it wasn't the lashings. It wasn't the nails that kept Christ on the cross. It was his love for us. That's what kept him on the cross. And he died for us this very day. The body of Christ broken for you. blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. The passion of our Lord. We're going to go through a series of lessons and as we do those lessons and as we read them out at the end of each lesson, a candle will be extinguished. Lesson one, Jesus' disciples fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. This comes from Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and confusing.
that statement today and has roots based on the Apostles' Creed to say whether his descending into hell was literal, to save the already deceased, or just a foreshadowing of death and losing its sting for the believers for eternity. And see, that sets up our hope. For us, that will be Easter Sunday, that release of all that bondage, the release of all that pain, the release of the suffering. He went and was tempted and denied temptation. He stayed pure and clean no matter what. That sacrifice was a pure and clean sacrifice. So during the Last Supper, Jesus washed the feet of his 12 disciples as they shared their final meal. An act of hospitality and humility. So let's begin with tonight with that act of a quiet humility by humbly receiving the breaking of the bread and drinking of the cup and the remembrance of these mighty acts. The cross is set and the nails are ready. We have, as Mark alluded to earlier, some paper up here, nails and hammers. We want you to bring your troubles and your sins and anything that you wish to give to Jesus. And, and oftentimes we've heard Mark say, bring that luggage and leave it at the foot of the cross. Leave that there. And we want you to take those and after you've written on the paper, fold it. And you can fold it as many times as you see fit. And take a nail and nail it to the cross. Just as our sins were nailed to the cross when Jesus was crucified. As Mark alluded to earlier, after the service, we will dispose of these papers and give the nail out as a reminder. So you'll take one of the nails with you as a reminder of this evening. Of turning those, whether it's a trouble or a sin or whatever you wish to give to Jesus, to be a reminder of that and turning it over to him. We invite you now to come forward. The papers and the pens are in the chair right there. The nails and the hammers are here.
As I mentioned, this is the time where we can bring our troubles and anything that we wish to send us anything to Jesus. Right now, I must admit that I'm a little bit embarrassed and a little frustrated, and I probably need to get another piece of paper and mail it. But as we put this together, pages are numbered. So if we repeat something, I apologize. But God has already forgiven. So I will take that. The following passage comes from Isaiah 53, 5, and it's from the message. It says, but he was pierced through our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging, and then 1 Peter 2.24 says, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. When we look at this passage in Isaiah, it describes what's going to happen some 740 years later. He describes the suffering of the Messiah and then writes the reasons for his suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions, our rebellion, if you will, and crushed for our iniquities or our depravity. By his stripes we are healed. Understand this is a spiritual healing, not a physical healing we are talking about here. Our relationship with God was broken and now is healed by the blood of Christ. The prophet Isaiah was pointing out that our sins required an atonement. Our sins required forgiveness. Our sins needed to be washed off each of us. But the traditional way that God's people atone for sin were just what Mark read earlier because I had those pages, but it was about bringing a sacrifice, a blameless animal. And this this, if Jesus had not come, this would have been something that would have continued, and it would have just been continual. And I can't imagine how much time as pastors we would spend killing animals and sprinkling blood. But Jesus came. He gave his life for us so that we could live. It honors that sacrifice when what we bring to the cross we leave at the cross. So whatever you wrote on those papers, leave them on the cross. We'll continue with Matthew 26. Then Jesus went with his disciples to the place called the Assembly. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will but as you will. 
Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink from it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he found the two disciples sleeping again because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This brings us to lesson number two. Judas betrays Jesus <coughs> with a kiss. Continuing in Matthew 26, starting in verse 47, going through verse 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi! And kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for. Then the men st stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion? That you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Lesson number three. Jesus before the Sanhedrin. Matthew 26, 57 through 68. Those who arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered there and sat down with the guards to see the outcome of what was happening. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could have him put to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men bring, are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. 
But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And he's worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? The end of lesson three. Lesson four, Peter's denial. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a, cro a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went out sad and wept bitterly. Lesson five, Peter before Pilate, Matthew 27, 11 through 26. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Do you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not to a single charge, to the great amazement of now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd, and at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus or Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called the Messiah. For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then when Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked? And they all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. Then Pilate saw he was getting nowhere, but that instead of that uproar, that was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, His blood is on us and on our children. And then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Lesson six, 
the soldiers mock Jesus. Matthew 27, starting at verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the patrium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. If you are the Son of God, in the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. The end of lesson six. <clears throat> lesson seven The Death of Jesus. Matthew twenty seven, forty five to fifty. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemai shemachabai, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing around heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now just leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. As we extinguish these final candles, the next slide will toll a bell 33 times for each year of Jesus' life.
doesn't it? Surely he was the Son of God. Matthew 27, 51 and 54. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Then the earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. As we close our Tenebrae service this evening in prayer, I would like you to reflect on these verses in Matthew and the story of Jesus' sacrifice. He gave his life up for you and I. He gave his life up for us to have salvation, to be reconciled with God. He gave up his life to return to us that which had been taken away in the Garden of Eden. And as the scripture tells us that one day Jesus will come back and he will return and he will bring us back home to be with him. First, when we die, we will go to paradise and then we'll be rejoined. We'll be reconciled. Our bodies will be restored. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And we will be able to live with Jesus for an eternity. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we can't begin to pay for what you've done. You have sent your one and only Son so that we might have total forgiveness, total reconciliation with you, salvation. What was separated is now put away. We are restored to you. Our relationship is restored to you. We have a path to eternal life with you sacrifice on the cross. Lord, we praise you and thank you that your plan has always proved true. Your word that you have given us, your holy and inspired word in the Bible is our gateway, is our pathway. And with the Holy Spirit living in, in us, when we give our lives to you, Lord, he is our guide to guide us upon that path, to bring us home to you in final victory with Jesus. We praise you and thank you in all these things. We thank you, Lord, that you have gathered us together here in your presence this evening to hear the story retold of that sacrifice, of that unending love that you have for the unending love that kept Jesus nailed to that cross. That unending love that gives us eternity with you. Thank you, Lord God. In your name we pray. And all God's people say.